Доброго дня. Дуже рада вас вітати на нашій Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our discussion, uh, which is dedicated to to a really painful topic as um, the continuation of um, work during at war. I'd like to thank the organizers for the possibility to take part in this meeting that we physically can meet here. Since the beginning of the war, I've been um, abroad and truly for me personally, it's really a valuable experience to talk and meet people in, in real life with the people wi wi with, which I, uh, with whom I lost contact. Uh, my name is uh, Lesia Kuczynska. I'm creator and visual studies researcher. Uh, it's quite ironic that I'm the moderator because uh, my personal experience is actually um, the it, it exemplifies this this issue. I um, needed to be evacuated in with a child. So as curator and visual research, um, researcher affiliated with the research platform of the Pinchuk Art Center, the first um, months I tried to uh, support my teams uh, within the platform, research platform. Uh, I also work w within um, um, Kyiv, um, Institute, but all these connections, I unfortunately I had to um, sever due to the wartime circumstances. So currently, I'm um, I need to introduce myself as an independent curator. So I really understand personally understand how difficult it is to um, to support uh, teamwork um, in wartime uh, to continue cooperation regardless of. A completely different uh, geographical context and the necessity to um, solve individual personal problems which are disaligned with the need to be synchronized with um, teamwork. Uh, therefore, I really do believe that this topic is uh, of vital importance. So I think we'll, um, today I hope we can outline some uh, positive scenarios for the future. So I'm happy to introduce uh, you the people who continue uh, teamwork and support their own teams and their own institutions. It's um, by order uh, on the slide, Andrei Usac, um, historian and creator of uh, Peace Latishi organization, dealing with uh, researching uh, traumatic uh, stories. Then Maria Lanko, um, co-founder of um, a gallery curator and co-curator of uh, the um, Biennale Ukrainian's booth. Uh, Alona Karavai, um, a multi-talented uh, person who um, co-created an organization as uh, Insha Svita, Hata Mesternia, Um, one of the residencies still continued uh, in wartime. She co-created uh, a gallery uh, called Kimnata and Post Impreza. Uh, moving on, Natalia Matsenko, uh, curator and researchers, researcher, art historian, and one of the co-curators of Len Art Symposium. And lastly, Katerina Radchenko, co-creator of the festival Odessa for Todays. I'm really happy to give the floor and my first question to the participants. I'd like to talk more about, uh, let them talk about their initiatives and their activity to dive deeper into the context and to learn about the specificity of their organization, how they function, what is the internal um, cooperation model and what kind of challenges they had to face in wartime and how they deal with or they cannot deal with um, the, um, the intricacies of, of, of um, teamwork, what kind of solutions you, uh, you came up with and how the situation impacted your activity. So first I'd like to give the floor to Andri. Can you hear me? Um, please show me when, when uh, the time is up. Just as you said, I, um, I represent um, 
the organization Peace Latishi. We have been cooperating for less than two years. It's quite a young uh, organization. Uh, the name Peace Latishi after silence um, stems from the fact that in the Soviet era, some of the stories, national stories were silenced. So we want to give voice to these uh, silenced stories. Um, our methods are quite simple. Uh, field, um, uh, field work, we work with private archives. That's what uh, is saved very often in um, wardrobes, in, in, in families' homes. Uh, so we need to dig them up. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, actually um, obtain access to, to such um, uh, archives. Uh, when it comes to, um, uh, this is actually uh, both legally and in fact um, a community institution. Um, as we are not a, a, a sister company of, of some association, uh, our office is um, a community-based um, uh, organization funded in Ukraine. When it comes to our team, uh, we've, uh, we've been operating uh, for two years. We started operating in the middle of the, um, of the pandemic. We continued uh, working um, in wartime in quite extreme conditions. Um, so in the first uh, project of a um, a short feature film. Uh, it was a movie on uh, lockdown. Our team is not uh, big. In fact, it's like seven person. Um, in theory, it's seven person, but in in reality, uh, if you take into account all people, it's several dozen people. Uh, as we need different uh, competencies, different skill sets. So we um, cooperate with many experts. Uh, we communicate with with many, many, many people. Uh, we are based in 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 Lviv, in Ukraine, but um, members of our team uh, are also abroad. Uh, we had no problems actually um, with uh, distance, as the, uh, currently we we have many instruments to uh, work remotely. Um, not always who is in Ukraine has the possibility to uh, take part um, in, in, in meetings uh, online uh, because it may depend obviously on a, on a, on a, on a Russian airstrike and, and the lack of inter internet access. Um, through people who are actually abroad, we uh, forge new connections, we meet new people, and we have started cooperating with uh, with new people in 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 the extended network. Uh, when it comes to our projects, uh, at the end of the last of last year, we uh, decided to think really carefully about our future projects, uh, to limit our focus. And we decided to, to cooperate with small museum institutions uh, to support local in initiatives. And it turned, turned out uh, it, it wouldn't work because of the start of the war. So since the onset, we had to reformat uh, the financing, um, the structure, and to prioritize. Uh, we made it. I'd like to say that uh, the first one, two months of the war, uh, featured most of the of the challenges. Uh, we didn't know what to expect next day. Uh, right now, it's also quite hard, but it was the hardest at the beginning. So our work was um, really difficult, but it helped actually people to center around uh, work and f uh, focus d in this difficult uh, time. So this was actually the first reaction to to the war, especially when it comes to the first wave of people who. Um, um, were coming to Lviv from the occupied um, territories. I wouldn't say it was a trend, but we could feel that yes, they are coming in. There is a lot of them. Um, so we decided uh, we wanted to document uh, the stories of these people. So on the one hand, uh, we used the help of um, oral stories, but so, so, so we had some discussions with people who 
uh, who stayed in, in Lviv, and we documented about uh, like two dozen stories, but we decided it's not a good time for, for analysis. We decided to leave it until, uh, for the time after victory. So our documentary ambitions were kind of um, limited after, after the, the um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Andre. It's you uh, give, gave us a very inspiring example, and I would like to give the uh, floor to uh, mm, to Maria. Have uh, the format of your work changed? Uh, uh, yeah, I have slides uh, for my presentation. So, if it's possible to give me a clicker. My name is Maria Lanko. I'm a partner and a curator of a gallery, The Naked Room. Uh, we organized it uh, together with my colleague uh, in 2018, and we co-founded it because we wanted to create, first of all, a platform and then a market for painters of, let's say, our generation. Uh, and it's called Emerging Artists. Uh, so these are authors uh, who um, created on the basis of their practice, but still they do not have enough uh, visibility for audience uh, in Ukraine and abroad. And so sometimes we cooperate with a few more experienced authors or their families that preserve their archives. For example, Pavlo Markov, Viktor Maruschenko and his family, I I'm sorry, Alexander Trekminov, family of Oleg Olosia, and we have been working uh, with their achievements a little bit different way. We look at their archives, at their achievements, and then we look at what was done in the beginning of uh, 80s or 90s. And one of such projects was our main project in 2022. It was a project of a Ukrainian pavilion on uh, in Biennale, and we wanted to present the Pavel Makos uh, work, uh, Fountain of Exhaustion, uh, but this this work uh, remained only an idea, and it was not created as some working fountain, functioning fountain, and so uh, we wanted to present it in a totally different context, not in a local context, but in a global context. And the problem of exhaustion, exhaustion even before the full-scale invasion, was very understandable to everyone. And therefore, we just could not uh, get prepared uh, f to this invasion. Uh, we invested a lot of resources, even in the end of 2021, uh, in order to create uh, this project. So we started discussing in our team different scenarios, even had our internal jokes, and our team is not very big. Uh, we uh, had a team of five people, uh, including me and Lisa, so there were two more managers except for us, and two of them uh, stopped cooperating with the gallery in the first day, but uh, we were able to get prepared, uh, but not to a full extent. First of all, we were trying to hurry up all our subcontractors uh, who uh, were responsible for production of this work. It uh, was uh, created in uh, Kiev. And uh, the main idea is a series of uh, bronze, uh, bronze elements, craters, and uh, and we wanted uh, subcontractors to hurry up their work and to finish uh, this installation uh, two weeks before the uh, two weeks before the deadline, and therefore uh, it, I realized that it just in case something bad happens, I can just put this installation to my car and go to uh, to Venice. But we have all the works uh, that. Uh, we, we have a family collection of Oleg Hossi, uh, and we have some other collections, and we uh, were prepared uh, for evacuation for the 24th of uh, February. 
And last but not least, I canceled out my working meetings. Uh, I uh, was supposed to be uh, in Dnipro on the 20th of uh, Dnipro and install the exhibition, but I decided in the last uh, moment to be at home if anything bad starts going on. So it was a key moment. And so um, on the 24th of February, after a few calls within our team, we decided that we have to do something. We have to evacuate uh, this fountain in the direction of Venice. Uh, and only I and um, uh, <coughs> only I, Eman, my, in my team, uh, only I could do this because my uh, parents are independent and uh, I have only my dog. So I just could, I could just pack everything together with me uh, and for 21 days I uh, was traveling and uh, I traveled around Europe I had some stops and on this way we received a lot of um, offers of uh, help support and uh, when I brought these craters to Italy on the 21st uh, uh, and we uh, met uh, the local company that finished building this whole fountain. And this is a story with a happy end, because during the opening session, we were able to be present uh, as a whole team. We had our painter, we had our architect, we had our communication managers, despite the difficult circumstances, uh, with the support of so many people and partners, we were able to do this. And, uh, and we had money for that. And this money went, uh, and was not given to us by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and uh, the second challenge that we had, and it was more difficult to overcome this, it related to two shelters of ours. Uh, we packed everything, but uh, in order to bring them away, we had to uh, take uh, a lot of efforts. Um, my uh, partner was pregnant at the time, so she, she had other priorities. And uh, there was another uh, colleague of ours, but uh, he, he, um, the, in Kiev, the, in, on the last week, uh, there were no, there was no one in Kiev who could do that, and we were uh, looking for some vehicle. Everyone, uh, um, all registered. Um, Carriers asked for some regi uh, for some official documents from the Ministry of Culture, and uh, also we were looking for some people who who uh, can ship uh, these works, and so we started to thinking about painters who remained in Kiev because they knew the gallery and they know how it was all presented inside, and uh, we reminded about uh, Paul Voragnov, who is uh, sort of our uh, happy star. Uh, and he was hiding on the left bank of Dnipro. Uh, if you know, all the bridges from the left to the right bank were blocked, and the only way to get to the right bank uh, was on foot. But because Vova Voratnyov had a very uh, uh, big experience in walking, because it's sort of his art expression, uh, I think that he would just not be able to offer such um, such job to anyone except for him. So uh, we asked him to help us, and we were just looking for some vehicle to ship this uh, this par this parcel. And here is Veronique Verishak in Olha Hanchar. And this is the very uh, bad picture of bad quality. This is the only picture they had uh, together. These are uh, activists, curators, and they were very active in bringing a humanitarian aid from the West to Kiev on their way back. He, uh, he was able to uh, bring part of our works, uh, in not only our collections, uh, but uh, s some uh, works of some other uh, artists. So he sort of smuggled it uh, during different uh, checkpoints. He had a lot of contacts on uh, different checkpoints. And uh, uh, we realized that we cannot bring it to, to some unknown shelter. We had to have uh, a very reliable par partner. And therefore, we found a partner in Lviv. And still, our archives are uh, there. So this is our gallery after the first two tasks, and the second, uh, the third task was, uh, what to, was to realize what should we do next? We should uh, have started thinking about 
uh, how to preserve our business because we were 100% dependent on the Ukrainian market. 90% uh, of our uh, collectioners were in Ukraine, but of course their priorities uh, changed. And therefore, in the beginning of May, we started thinking about how, how what we can do uh, next. And so we decided to work for expert and uh, try to find some new contacts. Uh, looking for some new ways for new markets and people who are interested in our collections. If you speak about Kiev Gallery, we decided that, of course, it's going, uh, it, it will be functioning. And uh, we uh, uh, established a foundation together with three other NG NGOs, um, Arsenal, uh, the Barona, and some other foundations. And uh, Therefore, they are establishing the media archive of uh, Marshall Times, and and this gallery is still a place of preservation for these works. And we are also inviting different curators who can um, make their pop-up exhibitions there. And the gallery uh, went to. Um, uh, to different other places. In the meantime, we were offered to take part in different exhibitions uh, in different galleries. And so here you can see our schedule. Uh, you see that our schedule is now in a new format in days, not in months or years. Basel, Warsaw, uh, Vienna, uh, Munich, uh, Vilnius, Berlin. Uh, and some more pro projects, Bratislava, Paris, Vienna, and Prague. Of course, for gallery, it was a saving uh, decision, fa saving life decision. We uh, um, got so many very useful contacts, but of course, we lack our own personal space. So now we are discussing how we can uh, get back and what program can we do because it's very difficult to be all the time in the condition of reacting to what is going on. Thanks a lot for your story uh, and thank you very much for this example that on the one hand your team uh, was really decreased because two people just uh, um, your team was reduced but again you had um, a lot of new partners a lot of uh, new people from different networks so these challenges pushed you to a sort of expansion of your activities of your network so thanks a lot in our uh, following speaker is Alona Karovai, and uh, I'm giving the floor to her. And uh, we will uh, hear, uh, listen to the story about the assortment room. Good afternoon. I'm very glad to see you. And in fact, I would like to comment uh, this schizophrenia uh, when I am uh, introduced as part of a few organizations. And our history is such that, our story is such that uh, we had one organization, but uh, a lot of new projects started popping up. And uh, so these projects became independent organizations. And therefore, up till now, uh, we create a sort of a system of organizations, of five organizations. For example, Natalia Deremenko here, uh, she is my uh, colleague, uh, and she is in some other project. And uh, since uh, 2004 until 2018, uh, we were uh, trying to work nomadically, uh, not getting attached to different spaces. But at that time, we believed that we have to create uh, we have to create such brands that are collective, that are not related, uh, not tied to some specific people. So we were not very public, and uh, so uh, one of the first crises was a COVID crisis, and it was. Uh, these were times when we had to adjust uh, our activities strongly. And on the level of teams, we realized that all these founders 
uh, had to start crisis management and they uh, had to be engaged in uh, crisis management. And therefore, we became visible faces and visible in a few organizations. But in the eventually, everything went smoothly. After COVID, our teams were a little bit changed. Some people left, some people uh, joined us, and we still were working with these five organizations. Some uh, people uh, were uh, interconnected, some knee. Uh, a few of them know, but uh, but uh, then the full uh, scale war started, and so our founders had to um, be engaged in uh, crisis management after the war. And so uh, every one of us uh, is working in a few organizations, and therefore it looks like a schizophrenia that we are in so many organizations. Now we have. Uh, more than uh, 30 people. We have two main centers in Ivana Frankivs and in Kyiv. Uh, all people, except for one person, they live uh, and work in uh, Ukraine. Um, most of them are women. And I would like to uh, introduce to you three organizations. And uh, Ivana Frankivsk story organization is not a very standard organization. And we started uh, creating non nomadic projects. First, we created a gallery, and then we started calling it assortment room. And in the beginning, it was sort of a standard and not very interesting project, White Cube. And we found uh, rooms that looked like rooms, not like gallery space. And this space is called Hata Maesternia, uh, house workshop. And, and uh, we started doing this after the first phase of the war. And it was during the times when a lot of members of uh, our uh, team moved from the east to the western part of Ukraine, and therefore we created this Hata Maesternia, first of all for ourselves, and then we started inviting new people. Then we created online and offline archive, and uh, this idea was incubated uh, in assortment room. Uh, we had uh, these ideas before, but uh, we implemented this project only uh, this time. And this center in Ivana Frankivsk, uh, what was our activity during this full scale invasion? And uh, we had very similar uh, activities uh, to what Maria told before, and we reacted in quite a similar way, except for, of course, uh, uh, the fact that we had um, we have now more and more exhibitions abroad. Now uh, this year we had four full-scale exhibitions uh, abroad, uh, which is quite a lot for our team. We also um, on the first 24th of February, my colleague Anya Pachomkina and I uh, we launched a um, small program of creating artistic works. And we were trying to do what we could at that moment. I don't think we have achieved much, but uh, we were able to implement only every third request. We were able to uh, take away six objects for uh, 600 objects, 400 objects. Uh, are either brought, were brought to the border or were sent back to the authors. And there are family archives, uh, uh, for example, a very big part of Fedorovich Tetiana. We were able to evacuate it uh, at the third attempt uh, in the beginning of March. And uh, there is also a museum collection of a uh, not very big museum from the south of Ukraine. And there are also some private galleries. So these are very different things, very various things. And when we are, uh, now we are uh, looking for ways to survive through the winter with all these objects. It's very uh, 
a big challenge. And during the networking, I was, uh, was not able to share uh, this experience well with my colleagues. But still, what we are focused at is how to hit the people, how to turn on the light in our office, how to turn on the ventilation and uh, lights in those uh, places where we need it. And this is a problem of our own and of uh, some other uh, Ivan Frankiv's facilities. We have uh, fewer requests for evacuation. There are some of them, but they are not so numerous. But we have to realize how to survive with our objects through the winter. Uh, and we had this space of a uh, house workshop, and we started creating internal residences uh, for artists that uh, left in Ukraine. Uh, we have an, uh, we have an open call for a new residency, uh, and s uh, since 25th of uh, December to uh, the beginning of January, we uh, decided to open this call. And during the first residency that was initiated by Lesa Homenka, who came to Ivana Frankivsk and just uh, dropped by uh, and arrived at our office, there were so many dogs and so many things that we didn't know about. And she said, let's uh, create a residency. And we uh, started doing this, and we call it the working room. And we uh, had more than 30 artists during this period. And 17 of them uh, were part uh, of uh, different exhibitions. And uh, basically, they created some uh, works that they wanted to exhibit within this uh, working room. And the third uh, thing which is very important to us is to realize how we can preserve the cultural life within Ukraine. In one of Kiev, in Kiev, our Kiev team organized and uh, did made the production uh, in Ivana Frankis. We were one of the first exhibitions that was opened uh, on the 1st of June. And it is very important question for us, for me, how to uh, survive during these times, how to uh, preserve the cultural life. And we understand that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And so we have to understand how to uh, make some meetings. Uh, of course, uh, all of you are doing humanitarian work at the moment. And uh, we have uh, uh, tr transported so many uh, life jackets and uh, different uh, uh, medicines and different bandages and different uh, materials from the Krakow Gallery from Berlin. And therefore, we brought it to Irp and to Izium or some other places. But this is a background work of all of us. But in general, uh, we have been existing for 18 years by now. And therefore, some people are with us are from the beginning. And some people are coming and going. And uh, therefore, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, do some of my private practice then to work uh, within this team. Um, and during these uh, crisis times, it allows us to regroup ourselves. And on the other hand, it puts a very large burden on co-founders who um, are responsible for more than one organization. And in such organization, it's very, it hurts a lot when any person leaves. If in some other structures, uh, people look uh, pragmatically at these aspects, uh, we uh, take this very emotionally. Of course, we try to overcome it, but it's sort of a nature of such organizational structure. Thanks a lot. 18 years is indeed a very long time. So even without the war, you would uh, lose some ma team members. It's quite inevitable that you need, there's a moment you need to uh, face. I'd like to give the floor to Natalia Matsenko so that she can say a bit more about that during the war, it's impossible to um, realize a project, but it's really interesting to to, to hear how um, your uh, community around the festival is still kept together. Can you hear me? Thank you. 
Thank you for intro introducing me. Thanks for everybody that could organize uh, today's conference so that we can talk about uh, the issues that concern us so much. My name is uh, Natalia Macenko. I represent Symposium Mohrica. It is a symposium, but indeed I think it's we can take a look at this uh, in a broader term as a community uh, project uh, because we include so many different practices. Uh, we work with sound, with performance video, and we cooperate with uh, local communities. Uh, this is why we call it Mohritsia. It's uh, the name of a local uh, community. You can see in the background um, the photo presenting this local um uh, space. Um, Arena said 18 years, which is uh, quite scary. Well, uh, Mauritia has operated for 25 years in a uh, Sumska region, and we can say that this is an indeed uh, an amazing um, example of a l really long term uh, cooperation. So that uh, but it also proves that um, there are long-term problems. Um, we we are facing uh, uncertainty. We l kind of live in the VUCA, VUCA times. So uh, I can tell you more about the place and the moment um, connected with the uh, with the very location, um, the place where Mohrizia is located. Uh, Mohrizia. Um, is situated si um, six kilometers away from the Russian border. Within 25 years of um, um, of um, the history of our organization, um, it's actually the first time that um, uh, the the celebration uh, jubilee um, had had not been uh, organized because of the war. Uh, we really believe that the landscape is really beautiful and it's quite a shame that we could not organize uh, this um, event. Um, um, this location actually includes um, beds of chalk dating back to the Mesozoic uh, era. So we were um, really hoping um, to um, promote Mohritsia outside of of our region, we wanted to reach out to the Kharkiv uh, region to let people know there that we do exist. And we, uh, the conclusion we actually came, um, uh, we made is that Mohritsia actually is unfortunately not possible outside Mohritsia. Mohritsia is a huge um, community of people. Right now we're talking about a cooperation, about community. In this sense, I believe this project is uh, very sustainable, very, very uh, constant. And it's really quite important uh, experience for me because uh, I rather work as an independent um, employee. However, I do feel that I'm part of Mohritsia, the Mohritsia community. So, um, we can be both independent and still be part of, of a local community. Because I believe the, com uh, the structure of this community is pretty democratic, pretty open and horizontal. Mohritsia uh, and its uh, creator, without whom uh, this um, organization could not, this community could not uh, have been possible for so many, many years. Uh, that includes many, many generations across uh, many generations we've, we've been uh, um, cooperating as one, uh, one community. However, this uh, community includes plenty of horizontal um, connections and I am one of the co-authors, co-curators um, of this um, um, endeavor, but in total, I was one of the eight uh, curators, and each group um, in a symposium it was really diversified, and I couldn't uh, possibly know all the people because there were plenty of people. Uh, but we can definitely talk about a general big uh, community. This community um, is not a 
organization in a classic understanding of the term. It does not feature a, uh, a, a registered seat and an office, uh, but they, they meet uh, cyclically. So the question is how sustainable the community is. Uh, the qu this question, actually, uh, we um, tried to answer even before the war. Uh, because of the nature of uh, of the organization um, so we continued our work um, in between uh, the symposiums uh, thanks to curators uh, right now um, in artistic sense uh, this project has been put on hold uh, but the community as um, as an area of mutual support is still continued because some people do continue their artistic um, endeavors, some collaborations, some other projects uh, which are presented uh, internationally as well. Some other people uh, from the team uh, works as a volunteer, some other people uh, fight in the army, uh, some other people help in, 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 in other forms. So we just understand that uh, we're waiting until the next symposium. Um, my understanding is, um, my approach is uh, strategic optim optimism. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but the place where I live is not occupied, but we don't know uh, ultimately um, uh, where Mohritsia is going to, 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 to be, whether it's going to be uh, occupied or not, uh, because of the close proximity to, uh, to the Russian border. Um, some people are more skeptical, some people are more um, optimistic, uh, but right now uh, the situation is quite stable. Um, so right now uh, we operate in, uh, on, on the voluntary basis and we continue working on site. Uh, what we have um, been speaking before about Mohritsia outside Mohritsia. These are some examples uh, from uh, 2019. Uh, we organized a uh, Prami Prostir uh, exhibition. And we just wanted to see how um, much this symposium outside Mohritsia is possible, how much uh, this can be taken out of the context of the location. It was quite a specific project, quite an unusual one, and the um, the exhibition itself was really uh, special. <coughs> it was connected with Mogretsia itself. You can see uh, it's, uh, it in the picture. Uh, there was a live uh, broadcast from, from um, Mogretsia. Uh, so Katya Lipkin uh, was one of the first people to, uh, uh, to broadcast live and to show what's really happening on site. Last year, Uh, we were talking about um, the connection we uh, it's about so as you can see in the photos um, you can s see some artifacts that were found on site and this exhibition we organized in an experimental format uh, as we it was uh, hosted uh, for 10 days in a gallery. Uh, it was quite an amazing experience. We, uh, we experienced a lot uh, in the process, but now as we, th as we think we, we could organize something similar, however, it's not uh, done. Um, uh, as we understand that uh, we have not really the, the uh, we're kind of deprived of the access to the location. So once we uh, regain this access, uh, hopefully after after the war, we can continue our our work. Uh, so I understand. So when, when we are back on site, this place will be different. We will be different ourselves. And uh, the very format of activity will uh, be altered as well. We are very curious uh, what the result uh, will be and how Mohritsia will look like uh, uh, after the war. Uh, when it comes to the stability and, and fragility, uh, in this sense, uh, I believe Mohritsia and uh, working there is pretty symbolic. Uh, you can see photos from, from, from last year. Within the three weeks, we worked in the opener in tents. 
Um, so Clemens last year uh, created a concrete tent, uh, a temporary fragile uh, artifact, um, which is a monument and symbol of the resistance and uh, the stability of the instable, unstable. Um, so on this moment, this uh, actually this, this monument has survived, it still exists. It is a temporary uh, object, but it survived uh, uh, extreme challenges. So we're waiting until the moment that we can come back uh, with our regular uh, non-concrete uh, tents. Um, uh, lastly, uh, this is this is the the, the ultimate slide, uh, also connected with the location. Uh, some mem team, uh, uh, members of our team um, work as volunteers. Some of them uh, work um, fight in the army. Uh, we know local people uh, told us that uh, some some rockets have flown over Mohritsya. Uh, but uh, our camp has not suffered. We received the information. So on the, on the left, you can see uh, the work that we did last year. It's a photo taken last year. And on the right, you can see a, a photo taken just uh, one month ago on site. Um, some, uh, the people in the photo you can see are the only people who are on site and had the access to, to the site. Uh, and the text uh, you can see is a correspondence with uh, curator, curators, uh, just making sure that everything is, is all right, everything is safe, but they decided not to really go deeper in the territory because it's not safe. Um, uh, some, of the, um, some of the cooperation is, is uh, transferred online, and uh, I can't really say, but uh, dozens of people exchange messages and they keep in contact uh, so that they are uh, updated. I would say that um, uh, some members are quite optimistic. Uh, you can see from, uh, from, from, uh, from the message, he, uh, the author of the uh, of the message is most um, the most optim optimistic, optimistic. He sends uh, regards from Mohritsya to everybody, um, but we're not creating any any new uh, monuments. Thank you so much. Very interesting uh, speech presentation, and I would like to emphasize that uh, two things resonated to me. The first very interesting case is when your team is still functioning, even though the project is suspended. Uh, it's very interesting. And I heard some similar stories about other initiatives and other projects. And due to the circumstances we are having now, it's impossible to continue some sort of activity, but still these teams uh, continue functioning. And so they uh, function as sort of networks of mutual support. And, we are t uh, and so people are trying to support each other as volunteers. And basically, these artistic infrastructures, they started functioning uh, as uh, some very valuable interconnections, uh, ties uh, between peop among people, uh, and therefore they were so valuable. And the second aspect uh, is that you mentioned that your community uh, functions as sort of horizontal network, and therefore you can uh, join unite both the individual and collective work. And I think that this is a guarantee of stability of your community, because in more hierarchical structures, it's much <coughs> more difficult to preserve such team. Uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to work in hierarchic teams uh, during the crisis times. But it, seem, it seems to me that your structure uh, is a sort of uh, uh, more stable structure. And now we will listen to uh, Katerina Radchinka and we will uh, listen uh, to, the, um, to her presentation about Odessa for today's. Uh, all the stories about my colleagues uh, all these stories are very similar to our experience. 
Odessa for Today is a festival that uh, was uh, founded in 2015 as a reaction to the war. And before this, and uh, our organization, our civil organization is still functioning. And this uh, festival became our main activity since 2015. And so we have our team. Uh, and the main idea of this festival is that we have uh, very big problems with the education and therefore we want to um, fulfill these gaps for photographers and for those who are interested in photography and therefore we focused on photography taking pictures and uh, throughout these eight years we have been trying to create such a platform where photographers uh, amateurs and uh, professionals uh, can receive information and knowledge. And therefore, we invited different photographers from different parts of the world. We invited curators, different uh, institutions. We cooperated with different uh, international festivals in order to uh, create network networking and uh, to uh, establish different connections and to provide access to information for Ukrainian community of Ukrainian photographers. Therefore, we, these are 36 countries that we cooperated with, and we planned to organize this festival this year, too. Uh, last time, our team met physically in Odessa in, in the end of January, and we started thinking about changing our form, format just in case, and this change of format was changed. We changed the subject and we uh, called it uh, probable um, precipitations and we uh, started thinking about what can we do if the war starts. We started thinking about new formats uh, and we started thinking about a uh, full-scale invasion and we started uh, um, discussing how can we react to that. But of course everything we uh, thought uh, uh, basically, it it's was so far from the reality because we really didn't understand uh, how the war looked like. And during the first week, there was uh, it was uh, such period when nobody w knew how to react. We were in panic, and my first task was to bring my family to a safe place. And once I got to Lviv, I started thinking about what we can do, what our team can do in this case. And most our colleagues, photographers, who have never taken pictures of conflicts or wars. They became war uh, photographers in one uh, during the one night, and most of our photographers started taking pictures of all those uh, changes uh, that uh, they saw, of all those consequences of this full-scale invasion. And these photographers, first of all, they did not have contacts or ties to publish these pictures to uh, disseminate them. But on the other hand, they didn't have enough time uh, for that. And therefore, we decided that we are going to be a temporary agency and we would support Ukrainian photographers from different cities to distribute their works. And therefore, we became sort of an agency that worked 20 hours uh, per day uh, for uh, four months. We were mm, uh, receiving pictures from uh, so many different places, from Mariupol, from Kharkiv, from Kyiv, from Lviv. Uh, so we had the full coverage of Ukraine. And in the same way, uh, we uh, said that if anyone needs something, if any, anyone needs some materials from Ukraine, we can provide such materials. And so we started providing materials, photos, and first of all, our task was uh, to uh, fight the information front line. So we wanted to present visual information about what is going on in Ukraine. But on the other hand, we wanted to support our Ukrainian authors so that they can publish their works and uh, re receive payment for their works because it is also very important. And 
these are a few examples of who we worked with. Um, it's just an enormous number of uh, publications of photographers. And it was very difficult for us to support, to the maximum extent, the Ukrainian authors through these publications uh, by uh, receiving some financial support for them. Four months later, uh, we were burnt out, first of all, m m I myself, because I saw so much more than I wanted to see, because uh, the photographers sent materials to us without pre-selection, and it was too overwhelming content for me, and it was very difficult to work with this content. And four months later, I realized that we can move on like this with, at such a speed. And uh, we also organized a few activities so that uh, the names of Ukrainian artists, uh, photographers became visible in the world so that they would receive uh, orders from international agencies. And we published uh, their uh, photos with the, their names and direct contacts. And I can say that all 30 photographers that we worked with, they have uh, cooperation with international uh, editorial offices uh, directly. And so our activities uh, supported uh, them. Uh, four months later, we also realized that, of course, we uh, continue our work, but it was very important for us to to <coughs> rethink the materials that we collected. And we made a few publications. One of the publications is the information front. Uh, it, it was, this publication was based on the photogra photograph uh, pictures from the first uh, thir uh, three months. And in this way, we wanted to uh, share the names of photographers. And we are selling this publication abroad, and all the money raised due to these activities will be used to support our artists and photographers at risk, or those who uh, lost uh, the job, or who uh, was relocated or lost their accommodation, or uh, if some photographer died to support their family. We also issued another publication within the Information Front series and with the same mission to distribute history uh, and to distribute the names and to raise funds to support our authors. We have also started to work with the exhibition spaces. So we returned to a more um, normal uh, environment. And for example, to show some military documentations in some gallery spaces, it's not working well. And therefore, we started thinking about different exposition solutions about different ways how to speak about not only about war but how to speak about the reasons of war and the changes in social and economic life that are going on and about what's going on with ourselves for example the exhibition the new abnormal was focused on uh, presenting how we live in Ukraine now how to present this surrealism this absurd we are living in to uh, make it more uh, close to uh, our viewers. A few examples of our expositions. We had a very uh, extended coverage. Of course, we are not visiting all the events. Most events um, are, we are cooperating uh, remotely with different institutions. We present in materials to them, and they print the materials, and we discuss the uh, installations with them uh, remotely. And I can say that there was another uh, breakthrough moment in uh, uh, August. Uh, we realized that it's very important to remember about teenagers. And four years ago, we launched a program, Future Photo Days, and it was a context for young photographers in Ukraine. In the August, uh, we, uh, um, want, uh, we wanted to write to our um, participants and to find out how they are doing. And we realized that more than half of them were on the occupied territories. 
uh, many of them left the country uh, or left these territories. And upon receiving the uh, responses uh, and uh, after talking uh, with the children, we decided to create a mentorship program for children, for teenagers from Ukraine. And uh, during the three man months, uh, children worked with uh, famous Ukrainian photographers. And as a result, we received uh, 40 projects of visual stories uh, and children presented how they survived through this war. It was in a private context, uh, and it was also related to direct uh, documentation of some specific events. And now we want to present these works because it's totally other vision uh, through photography. And it's very important to support them, and not only to provide knowledge to them, but to make the next step to show these materials in order to receive some payment for these works to support them. In, in the end, I would like to say that our activities, uh, first of all, they focus on uh, distributing information about what is going on in Ukraine through photography. The next uh, uh, goal is to support Ukrainian authors and the third task that we have organized a few events and we sold some Ukrainian uh, photos to raise support for different foundations. For different needs. Uh, so this is uh, briefly information about our activity. This concept, the idea of uh, the team uh, is broadened. I can see you operate as uh, a network, a huge network of mutual support. Um, so it's, it's not within, just within uh, the festival. So I wanted to ask another question. Um, does the team change or have some changes been introduced in the structure? Our team has not uh, changed essentially. Uh, two people um, left but uh, for objective uh, reasons, uh, simply because of their children. Uh, first months, first two months, um, um, I was responsible for everything. I was quite, everybody qu was quite lost and everybody had their own, f uh, had to take care of their family and, and, and uh, b bring them, uh, take them to safety. Uh, we managed this, uh, our team um, evacuated uh, their families and secured the safety. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have much time, but I wanted to add another question and ask you um, to reflect on the the, um, the experience of uh, cultural activity in wartime. Um, as it turns out, when when you um, it turns out uh, everything clarifies when, when you're in extreme um, circumstances. I have a completely different um, experience, but we also have a, uh, ex uh, uh, the experience of the pandemic. So we um, develop some kind of mechanisms to work in extreme uh, circumstances. But I'm really interested how your experience of uh, collective work during the full-scale invasion uh, in the um, volatile times, uh, as you are um, extremely tired, you're not sure how your life is going to look like, you're constantly um, compelled to think of something new um, and to find out new modes of cooperation. Um, we constantly are uh, in, 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 in the need of making things up um, in impromptu. So as you analyze yourself, uh, do you think there are some um, skills, some, some inventions that you would like to uh, incorporate into your further uh, activity? Have you found uh, some interesting um, discoveries and possibly some, some, some new modes of cooperations, uh, cooperation in your institutions? Uh, can we retain uh, some um, some some insight and and use it for for better? Thank you for the question. I don't know if I uh, I will answer it because um, 
uh, in educational theory, there is a theory that in the zone of panic, we cannot learn, we just survive. So the question how much uh, can we learn in such uh, circumstances as we are preoccupied with completely different uh, goals? I wanted to support your, uh, your statement that in, 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 in a crisis, you, um, you've got a very clear idea what you need to focus on. Um, so in the further phase of, of the war, um, team Um, it is evident members simply understood uh, what they need to focus on essentially. Whether I want to devote my time on this work, as much as I'm not sure how much time there is left indeed, uh, how, uh, what I really want to devote my life to, what I don't want to devote my life to. Uh, another question of, uh, dating back to the COVID times, uh, since the lockdown, uh, about four to eight months, we have identified that uh, some team members started to drop, um, um, drop out. And I can see something very similar um, following the six months of, um, of the full-scale uh, full -scale, full invasion. Uh, that people simply drop out of the team because they don't want to uh, um, devote their time to, 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 to this work. Uh, after lockdown, um, I started working uh, with mental health, how to incorporate these ideas into, um, into daily work, but how to also not to, um, um, to place the responsibility for the mental health on the leader, but so that everybody, every team member feels responsible. Uh, so how to, uh, the, the idea was to how to um, uh, talk about such is issues and how to understand that um, different members of the team will be in, in different, um, um, on, on, in different situation when it comes to the mental health. Um, I wouldn't say there is a golden solution to, to this issue. Uh, I heard it on Twitter, actually, that some that people people in West Europe uh, talk about uh, socialism and people in the East, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, they have gone through socialism. It's a very subjective point of view, but I believe in, cr in a crisis, uh, what turns on is the necessity of leadership of just a handful of people who can make real change. It stems from my experience that horizontal ex uh, structures uh, were very vulnerable in times of crisis. In my experience, horizontal structures are structures for good times. But possibly it's just my uh, subjective opinion, so please take it with a, uh, with a grain of salt. Indeed, um, we stopped uh, working as uh, as a team uh, after uh, after the full-scale invasion. Uh, in the first place, people just focused on <coughs> on their own situation. They needed to uh, deal with um, emergent uh, issues, uh, and I actually myself. Um, faced that it was my, the first time I had been uh, alone because my whole life long I have worked um, as a team collectively. Um, but as you understand, there, there, there were some objective reasons for that. So um, it was extremely traumatic experience for me. That's a role I r really hate being a leader, but um, it, I, it just... I just had to uh, draw it to an end. On this path, um, I became much more open to the world, to other people as well. In Kyiv, um, my situation was very comfortable. However, I did not need to uh, communicate with other people. But in a situation when, uh, in a in a in a hostile environmental uh, environment. Uh, you need to answer so many, so many questions, uh, deal with so many issues. I just uh, had to become open and communicate with other people. 
uh, so I changed in, in, internally. Uh, it was it it was a dramatic dramatic um, uh, change for me to communicate with the world. It's hard to analyze uh, experience which is ongoing. Um, maybe I will uh, get back to you uh, after some time. But honestly, um, uh, I feel that um, dynamic situations require dynamic decisions um, and to um, solve some issues with your team uh, on, on uh, re really fast and to, uh, especially in project work. Uh, what we lost I within our skill set, uh, we deal with uh, oral histories, oral stories, um, and the experience of the past. In the pa in in spring, we received some uh, offers to be included in some offers dealing with uh, documenting documenting uh, Russian uh, war crimes uh, in the time of the deoccupation of uh, of our territories. Uh, so we were supposed to, 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 to help individually as and as a team. Um, uh, but it turned... Uh, and uh, as, I, as I see the results of, um, of this project, I, I believe it was really... Uh, it, it's a really important uh, topic and that was a very good decision to take part in this project. However, we are not uh, lawyers and people expect the people with whom we we uh, we, we, we talked uh, to, to the to the um, to the people uh, afflicted by by the war they expected uh, legal advice from us uh, but um, uh, um, but it was a really worthwhile project. Uh, we know that um, a lot of museums, a lot of institutions have been robbed. Um, so we know that we, we, we lost uh, a lot uh, because of the invasion. Um, we don't know exactly the extent of, uh, of such losses. So definitely the, uh, the fragility uh, is, 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 um, is really present. Horizontal structures is not a golden uh, mean to uh, to such situations, but we need to um, we need to remember that uh, there is always somebody at the top, and below we've got horizontal structures. Uh, when it comes to horizontal structures, I think there are two types of such structures: the one where no one takes responsibility, and a horizontal structure with many people taking responsibility. I believe that right now uh, what that Ukraine um, is winning in the war, uh, and I hope it, this is happening uh, pretty quickly, exactly thanks to the horizontal structure with many people who um, take the responsibility. Uh, I know it's not um, uh, it's not happening with everyone. Uh, people are different indeed, but overall I believe uh, that, uh, for example, with Mohritsya, there is a moment of a uh, of a number of people who just take responsibility and face the challenges um, who have become ever more formidable um, indeed objects which uh, which uh, have um, which we created even twenty five years ago right now they they have been destroyed uh, uh, this territory simply is not um, uh, protected uh, because Russians are, are shelling the area. So it's impossible to preserve uh, our artifacts. Uh, but people do feel the need to uh, bear the responsibility. And I hope that um, when we talk about how we can incorporate uh, our experience into our practice, I agree that uh, we need to speed up taking um, decisions. Uh, and we cannot allow for uh, the inertia that um, prior to the war uh, we uh, we could. Uh, right now we ca we do not have the luxury. Uh, so such um, uh, uh, such 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 skills as um, and habits of taking uh, uh, decisions swiftly uh, are really good um, 
uh, takeaways to to take from um, from 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 the war and incorporate into our uh, community work. Thank you so much. On the one hand, it seemed to me that nothing changed except for speeding up, just like everyone, and uh, only a radical vector or direction of our work uh, has changed, that we are working not with the materials we would like to work. We are working more with international institutions. And I also realize that, uh, that nowadays we do not know who uh, is going to be available in our team. And of course, it's related to power supplies shortages. Uh, our team is uh, in a majority in Ukraine, only one person is abroad. So nobody knows. Uh, and we are based in different cities in Kiev and Odessa. And we never know uh, when the shelling may happen. And we don't know what to expect. And so uh, everyone in our team uh, knows that if you are you should be, uh, you should stay connected, and you should support and replace someone if someone is not able to work. So we are in full emergency, uh, in full readiness to replace uh, someone from our team, and so it's a very big difference comparing to our previous experience. And so now you see that. You all have started talking about this responsibility, and I think that it's very important that we started to speak about these horizontal uh, lines. And it seems to me that it's very valuable to speak about what Masha mentioned. Uh, we, on the one hand, we see that teams are breaking up, and you have to take responsibility, and you ha have to be individualized. Uh, and this is an experience of individualization for every one of us. But basically, every one of us uh, is, has been left alone in these problems. And it seems to me, in, in my opinion, that this experience of individualization, this is this necessary background so that these uh, horizontal ties would exist. If, because if nobody takes responsibility or everyone takes responsibility, uh, then it doesn't work. But horizontal is when everyone takes responsibility. It means that if everyone feels uh, this individual responsibility, then we can share responsibility among all of us. So I th think that this absence of uh, responsibility uh, is more uh, in hierarchic organizations. But if you want to create some horizontal structures, we have to learn how to take responsibility on yourself. And you should realize that at one moment or another, you will be responsible for something. This is a very valuable experience. And I would like to say that the aspect that Alona mentioned about mental health and uh, we as head of different organizations and people who are working in teams, they have to uh, develop sensitivity towards each other. We have to be very sensitive towards uh, each other. Before the war, I can speak about my own experience also in different institutions. Quite often we were trying to uh, leave everything behind and we were not trying to focus on our personal problems. We were trying to just leave our personal problems at home. But this approach is much more difficult now because we have our personal problems, mental problems. We have uh, necessity to obligation to take care of someone. So it's very difficult to turn a blind eye on such aspects. And therefore, I remember, um, I reminded that a few years ago, I wrote such an article, Feministic Code of uh, Organizations. Um, and uh, it was written there that, um, why feministic? Because mainly women take care of some other aspects of some of their children, of some other members of family. And so when working in institutions, we have to take into account our obligations, our personal obligations to take care of some other people. And so it's very important 
uh, in institutions work uh, when we are trying to create some schedules, when we are trying to uh, create some cooperation. And so we should realize that every one of us uh, is engaged in some other uh, activities except for professional activities. And we have 10 more minutes left. So I would like to give floor to the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to comment or to ask us about something. You can also share your own experience that relates to the topic of our discussion. So if you want, please raise your hand and I will pass the mic to you. Uh, without the mic, we cannot hear the question. First of all, thanks a lot. Uh, so many things triggered me. And a very simple question, practical question. A lot of you mentioned your own teams. And please say, do you have any recipes for self-revival? Self um, because as Katrina said, my battery is almost low. And so what are you doing inside your teams? Do you have your best practices? Yes. Uh, it seems to me that it happened uh, maybe two months later, the first two months. It seemed to all of us that it's going to uh, end soon. And the first two months, uh, I went to the office in uh, one and the same clothes. And I said that I'm going to change my clothes when the uh, war is uh, over. Mm, so uh, it's good that I realized that it's not a good approach. And we decided, no, we have to change our clothes. And uh, once we realized that we have to turn to another moment, uh, to uh, another mode, we started um, switching off. Um, and recharge our batteries, uh, inner batteries during evenings and during weekends. And uh, quite often now we are work in, uh, two, uh, in a team of two. And for one organization, two people are responsible. And when I'm working with someone, uh, and it helps me to realize that if I fall behind, my partner uh, is going to support me. For example, my colleague Olga Dyatil is my second part who is supporting me. I realize that this is a steel uh, iron woman and uh, she is going to support me. And if she is switched off, I'm going to support her. So um, even if not all our team is able to support uh, us, it's very important to realize that at least we have one partner within the project who is going to support you. Uh, I would like to say about me, and my team is working in three cities, and therefore we cannot um, support each other physically. But my personal experience is quite strange. I can say uh, that when I'm living abroad and I'm living abroad only due to some projects, to some work, uh, and I uh, try to do it during some very short travels, and each time I think I have to have some rest, but I cannot have rest abroad. But when I'm back to Ukraine, uh, I'm getting more and more scared. And when I'm getting scared due to air raid sirens and so on, and uh, uh, I, therefore I work. And I work so much that I do not have enough time to get scared. And so this being around uh, your relatives at home, despite the situation, despite whether there is a power supply or no, it uh, charges our batteries so much and it motivates us to uh, move forward. So it's very important for me to uh, live abroad from time to time and because afterwards I realize how important it is for me to stay at home and then my battery is charged. We allow ourselves some vacations, holidays. I know that quite a lot of people are not able to go to the seaside or to some paradise uh, or resort uh, and uh, have rest without phone or emails. But after three months at working uh, in pavilion and after opening, uh, I was just 
not able to uh, get up from the bed. Uh, although I didn't uh, feel myself tired because it was sort of adrenal adrenaline rush. And therefore, I understood that if I do not stop and make a pause, I won't be able to do anything. Uh, and therefore, all my uh, holidays um, uh, are in Kyiv because uh, I spend quite a lot of time abroad. Therefore, I'm going to Kyiv and have holidays there. And previously, uh, we curated all the exhibitions all together, uh, but uh, nowadays we are working with some old projects that we left in our uh, shelters, and these projects do not require so many detailed discussions. And we know very, um, and we know very well who is doing what, and so it helps us to save our energy. Uh, because you are not doing 10 projects at one, but for example, seven or eight. My answer to this question uh, can be divided to two parts. First part is our experience in Mogritsa, and the other experience uh, my, is my personal experience. Uh, Mogritsa is not functioning as a cultural institution, but we are preserving our society, our community, and therefore my work is very intensive, but it is related to many other projects. And so personally, I felt the uh, fear of being burnt out. And uh, I see that we have so much work. And so I received uh, such an advice from uh, my colleague. And she said, you are a curator. Uh, invite yourself to residency and tell to everyone, I am uh, at the residency of uh, um, I'm at the residency of some artist. And therefore, I'm trying to organize this res residency for me. And we will see uh, what I will be able to achieve. But if you speak about Mohritsa, then we are planning to meet with part of our colleagues uh, in December in Kiev. I think it will be a very important moment for us because uh, we uh, worked a lot all together uh, and we met uh, sometimes physically, uh, not only via Zoom, but um, also physically. And I think that it's also very, uh, very inspiring to us. But I think that uh, the biggest relief we will have when we are going to arrive to Mogritsa. But uh, because of tiredness, exhaustion, uh, we felt it even last year. We uh, saw that the, mm, this project became so large uh, and we realized that we are so tired and we felt that we are overwhelmed. There are so many of us. The program is so uh, packed, and uh, there are so many presentations, so many projects. Uh, and, um, and therefore, we even dedicated a few sessions to rest. Yes, I think that everyone will need revival uh, uh, to a restoration of our, if, uh, of our strengths after the victory. Yes, there is a, such a tradition. And when there is some critical moment or some shelling, and you know that uh, for two days uh, you won't have uh, power supply, everyone understands it. And therefore, we uh, gather all together in some uh, space. I think it helps uh, because then we can discuss our plans, even though that these plans are not going on, uh, to be implemented. But still, at least it's um, inspiring that we are thinking about future. Thank you. It's a great uh, conclusion to our discussion. Uh, we were talking about strategic optimism, so that planning, despite uh, of what's happening right now, um, it's really important for us to build bridges into the future. Uh, so let's remain strategic um, optimism optimists and continue our cooperation and support each other. Thank you very much.